Jose Rivera, playwright and screenwriter. The LARC is a laboratory for the development of new plays by American playwrights. I'm gathering with wonderful young writers, Chris, Dominique, Susan, and Ray. We're going to discuss our work, and we're going to give a, a really thoughtful look at what contemporary American playwriting looks like today. This is a great spread. Hey, hey, thank you. Day. I worked yeah. all day. Um, um, Susan, these are gluten free. Oh, thank you. <laughs> these, are these are real strawberries. Great. Great. <laughs> this is to course and then to drink. I'm sorry? It's tea. It's, yeah, it's tea. tea. You want some? It's, it's, okay. it's hot. You love tea, though. <laughs> you love tea. You drink the tea. <laughs> so I was just wondering, you guys, um, thinking about like the fact that all of us are, you know, have committed a good portion of our lives to being in the theater, and some people might say that the theater itself is a bit dysfunctional and it's not a great relationship for writers. Um, and so I was just wondering what it was that got all of you. Um, hooked on the theater, fell in love with the theater, decided that this is the place to put all my creative talent and all my abilities. Um, because, let's face it, you know, very talented group of, of writers. You could have done anything else. You could have made money, <laughs> <laughs> uh, write novels, screenplays, and you still might, of course. But there's something about this particular art form that draws you and um, calls you year after year and day after day. So. Um, you know, I'm curious how, how that happened for each of you. I remember that I had to be like this like leading girl and I was really awkward in sixth grade and had really, really big glasses and just like everything. And um, I remember there was this part in the play where he had to say something and call me like pretty, like, oh, you're the most beautiful such and such in the world or, you know, and I remember going, all of the eighth grade girls are going to just dog me as soon as like he says that in front of the school. Like this is, it was terrifying, you know? Plus they all think he's cute, so they're just gonna hate on me. <laughs> and so uh, he gets to the part and he goes, you know, you're the most beautiful girl in the world. And I'm like, Here goes. you know, I have like braced myself and I'm gonna keep going. And it was silent, you know, it was silent. It was silent with the eighth grade girls, my Classmates were silent, like everybody was silent because they were, not because they thought I was the most beautiful girl in the world, <laughs> but because they were so into the story by this point, like it was such a good play to us <laughs> that they were just so committed. And I was like, wow, like you can really believe anything in this theater right now. Like it can really make the mean girls like not be mean. Like mm -hmm. this is something this is doing something. I'm hooked. I'm safe here. I'm staying forever. Wow, that's great. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Ray, do you have something like that? Um, well, you know, I was I was in grade school plays also, but it, uh, the first time I really loved being in a play, I was a, a freshman in high school, and it was Eeyore in the House of Food Corner <laughs> at the community theater for like the kids, like the kids for the kids shows. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know what it was about that particular moment, but it is really my first memory of being in theater and really loving it, having a really great time. You know, the rest of the cast were really fun. And I love Eeyore, actually, in real life. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that was a thrill. But then, and then I think as a writer, um, uh, when I came, I, I went to NYU for acting, actually, not for playwriting. But that first year, I saw um, Angels on Broadway. Oh, wow. And I was like, oh, wow, you can really do whatever you want. You know, it's just, it's one of those plays where, like, you can really write whatever you want. Mm -hmm. You can do whatever you want and make it work. Mm -hmm. And that, that was probably the most inspiring. Yeah, for me, it wasn't anything as lofty as Angels in America. It was, <laughs> it was Rumpelstiltskin, which I, I saw in sixth grade. And I, I was one of those kids raised on a television set, basically. Mm -hmm. And I always found TV very lonely. And watching the play was like the first time I ever had a group experience with a bunch of people where we all laughed at the same time and were quiet at the same time and listened at the same time. And I thought, this is, this is amazing. You know, this can be that way. You know, I'd never experienced communication that way with a group of people. Mm -hmm. That really hooked me. Mm -hmm. What about you? Um, so I, I did some acting, but I was never very good at it. I, I took this playwriting class at the Honolulu Theater for Youth when I was 15. We had to write a play. And I think the idea of 
just telling a story, like two people t are just having a conversation, but like everything changes, and the simplicity mm -hmm. of just like people in a room talking, I guess it sounds very Jacobian, but like that idea <laughs> of like just telling a story with people, yeah, once I found that, I just kept doing it. I wasn't really social when I was a kid, I was sort of a nerd, and I remember um, I did Romeo and Juliet my freshman year in high school, mm. And as most people know, I don't like Shakespeare, but I didn't know better back then. Um, oh, wait, I, are you allowed to say you don't like Shakespeare? I, I, don't yeah. think, I, don't I think, that, think I've just ruined my career. <laughs> 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 well, you know, there it is. is yeah. I just yeah. leave right now. Um, and I got I got cast in Romeo and Juliet, and I was um, I was typecast. I was Paris. Um, and I just I just remember it was it was like the first time that I was pe people were forced to interact with me and you're all sort of like it's it's similar to that like um, because you're in a room together creating something all this sort of like social boundaries sort of fell apart and you were just in a community um, and in a way it's it's been great because it's the place that I um, it feels the most dangerous but I also don't feel scared um, mm -hmm. so I, I love that sort of thrill of that. Yeah. I think, like, growing up in Hawaii, there's an idea of, like, you know, if you do something bad, the volcano goddess is going to get you. If you bring pork <laughs> over the highway, like, the, you know, things, like, bad things are going to happen. There's ghosts everywhere. Pork and I, over the highway? Yeah, it's a thing. Oh, okay. um, but, but, you know, so the way that I was sort of raised and my reflection of the world, it wasn't exactly realistic. There was something Ooh. mythic about it. So mm. I feel like, for me, like, reading those plays, I, I love the language, how muscular, like, the conversations were, but there was something like not reflective, and so I feel like the freedom to say like this is a prison, you can have plays be experiential. That's great. Yeah, I had a similar experience with, with as Ray as a as an adult uh, watching. I saw the closing night performance of Buried Child in, in 1979 wow. when many of you were born. <laughs> so yeah, and so, you know, watching this play, I didn't even know who Sam Shepard was. And I remember watching this in this whole thing in Act Two, where like the, the characters are on stage shucking corn. You know, they just had this corn in there, and someone in Act One had said how the land had been, you know, uh, barren and nothing had grown. So all this corn had grown like literally overnight. And I was sitting in the audience, going, "That is such a lie. Corn can't do that. <laughs> you know, what is this? This is nonsense. This is crazy." And then I thought about it for another point four seconds, and I go oh wait, this is a play about fertility. And suddenly like this metaphoric power of theater just hit me suddenly like, oh, that's what it's really about. It's not about the thing. It's about what the thing symbolizes or what the thing means on a whole other level. And that, that completely changed my point of view on writing and on theater. That you know the the, the realistic plays that I grew up with were, are wonderful, but that's not the entire answer to theater. You know, realism isn't the entire answer, and that Sam Shepard in his play and, and and Tony in his play were showing us a broader canvas and a more beautiful landscape in which to to draw. And I thought that was quite quite wonderful um, experience. I read Angels in America. I just read a lot of like Miller and O'Neill and like all the stuff that everyone reads 87 times throughout high school and college. And I just didn't like it. I mean, now as I'm older, I appreciate it, but I just wasn't interested in it. It felt very stale to me. Mm -hmm. And then when I, the first time I read Angels, I was like, there's a million characters and magic and you know, and it was so um, epic and crazy. And it was the metaphor that sort of sucked me into, mm -hmm. into doing it. Um, well, it's funny that you say that. I did not read all those things in high school. And in fact, in college, yes, but it just still didn't speak to me. And what I had discovered in high school was George Wolfe. You know, I had read mm -hmm. The Colored Museum mm -hmm. after I had read, you know, For Colored Girls Who Consider Suicide. What I realized with George Wolfe's play, um, which was really transformative for me uh, as an actor, as a playwright, was that you can write these vignettes, you know, or that you can, mm -hmm. with uh, in Suzaki, you could write choreo poem. I didn't even know well, how to write a linear play for a very long mm -hmm. time um, until I started engaging with other peers and seeing people, you know, tell a narrative tale that was different. And I said, oh, okay, I'm going to try to write a straight play, you know, a straight play. I don't mm -hmm. even know what that is. But, um, <laughs> And it, it, I ended up reading like a lot of August Wilson and Pearl Clegg and, and all these people that are considered, you know, classic writers from the canon that I've been exposed to, but that in this greater theater canon, you know, I know people that don't know who Pearl Clegg is or who don't know who the writers who I've grown up reading are. And I realized that what becomes like the classic writer or those writers that we're all supposed to know really does change depending on your, you know, cultural history and, and what you've been exposed to, right? Mm -hmm.
I was riding the subway and I saw a group of workers for MTA. It was a woman among like three men. They all had like a little bit of dirt on their faces and their and their hands and stuff. And she did too. And she had cornrows. And she was older. She was the same age as my character. The way she was engaging with the men was so. It was almost like they were all the same, and I loved it. I loved their respect for her, their community with each other, and I, I was watching them, listening to them have a conversation. For, and I was like, wow, this is exactly what I'm trying to write, which is like this makeshift family of workers. I told them I was eavesdropping on them, and, <laughs> and they didn't mind. And I just engaged in a conversation for a moment. I know people, when they're picking up dialogue sometimes as writers, they listen to the people that ride the subway because they'll give you like, you know, you'll see somebody whose world you're not normally a part of and you get to hear like some major things about their life sometimes on the subway. I think that that's where it begins, but for me it can't end there to capture a couple of sounds and things like that and maybe some inspiration. But if I think I know a people and I can write a people because I've overheard them on the subway, I'm really naive about those people. I have to be able to engage with people and have a conversation with them and be able to go into their community before I feel like I can truly bring justice to them as a writer. This is kind of like when I, to get me out of getting stuck or I need color <laughs> stimulation, you know, and like things to just make my ideas pop for me. It's a contact sport, really, theater. It is definitely a, a social sport that requires other people to be in the room with you at some point, you know. This is for communication with other people. Community, family, and love, justice and injustice. That's where my work tends to focus. Music to me is one of my main ways of getting involved in writing. Music really lands me in a time period or in a region. It helps me capture the dialect and the words that are popular, the isms and the sayings. And that's part of my process is just getting myself sort of textured in the world that I'm writing about. And then the characters. I walk around with them, you know, in me for a while. I think, what will they think about? You know, sometimes I have to write out what do they do when they're drinking or what do they do when they're sober? And how do they operate? What's their favorite song? I, I brainstorm a lot, you know. I think of the issues that are related to the people that I'm creating. The, I don't write a play about the issues, but issues always impact some people somewhere. So I think of what issues are important to me, and then I decide who I need to tell the story of who that issue impacts. And I like people with the dirt under their nails, I call it. People that are, we're not hearing from, I think. You know, who are the people that we see every day that have a little dirt smudge under their face because they're doing that hard labor, and we're passing by them every day, and we don't know their story. I want to know their story. My husband is a hip-hop artist. When we dance together, which we love to do, it helps both of us to sort of defy time and space. I want to love, I want to live. Sometimes when we're dancing, we, we quote lines from like movies where people have danced. <laughs> I'm a writer of color, I'm a, a black woman playwright. I'm a part of a marginalized class. And in theater right now, we are still working to make space for ourselves to be seen on stage and produced on stages. 
and it means that I have to get in conversation with theaters often and advocate for my work and advocate for a new audience so that the, the old guard that's in theaters right now is not the only audience that has to exist, that theaters' audiences can start becoming more diverse, just like the writers who are writing for theater, which I'm a part of, you know. So it's, it's about making space for everybody's voice to be heard. I would love to see my work produced at regional theaters across the country and in, with audiences that are diverse and new, you know, that aren't necessarily the traditional theater goers. The Playwright of New York Fellowship allows me to live in an apartment this year without having to pay rent and supports us with a stipend so that I can afford to just be a full-time playwright without having to take on a day job. And I've generated more work this year than I've ever generated in a year in writing. Before I go from this tale of woe, I want it's interesting, we were joking earlier about how playwrights are an endangered species. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think I don't think playwriting itself is endangered, but I do think that, maybe I'm being too pessimistic, but <laughs> that the kind of theater that we all like sitting around this table is an endangered species in a way. I mean, theater that's based on language and metaphor and that takes you know re reality and twists it into more poetic forms. Because the kinds of plays that we you know, that we want to write and do write, we, we look around at the larger landscape and we go, those plays aren't necessarily produced. It seems like there was a lot of those writers doing that kind of work, you know, 15, 20 years ago, and now it's like still you guys, but our generation has sort of not been allowed to do quite as much of that, it seems. Um, and it seems, I fight it. I, no, 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 I think we're trying, but, and, and I, there's a lot of writers that I really love that are like sort of white writers who are writing naturalism, but it seems like in the theater, What's being rewarded is like 90 minute plays with four actors in a living room. And those guys are like writing for TV and having movie careers and like, you know, getting all these awards. And those of us who are writing like, you know, bigger plays with more characters or magic or language, it seems like those plays take five or six years to mm -hmm. get produced. And when they do, there's like one of us a year who gets that production. And then we have, so it, it, that's, but I, you know, I, you sort of try to figure out how to like, both do the thing that you are and the thing that's going to get you into the right. the production. Do you, do you think of that? I mean, do you think, I need to write a play that this X producer will produce or this theater will produce? I think I this is, the the last year is the first year that I really actively have. I don't think that I did in the past and, and I was really like, it'll happen eventually. Um, and now, I think in a way I'm like, if I write the five person 90 minute play in the living room, am I selling out like who I am as an artist? Mm -hmm. And so what I've tried to do is say, how can I write that play and be who I am? Right. It's been surprising for me this year that my first professionally produced play in New York is one that I didn't think would ever happen. It's mm -hmm. this like 20 person play mm -hmm. with like a black actor and like three Asian actors. And yeah. you know, it's really diverse and the flea did it, and it, it, it's because they have this company that has this resident ensemble mm -hmm. of actors. Um, and so in, in a way, it's like, that was surprising, and, and every once in a while, the theater will surprise you in a, in a, in a beautiful way. I, I have written for the what we think will get produced, no, I'm not in subject matter, but just in constraints. I look at them as creative constraints, yeah. you know? I mean, right now, we're living in a world of tremendous sort of technological explosion and crazy innovations and things, and I just wonder what you feel, like, how does this ancient, you know, archaic form that is all about sitting around a fire telling stories, how, how does that fit in? You know, how does it fit in into the world of, you know, the phones and the internet and things like that? And I think, I think we're that. in constant communication, but it's not as deep as it used to be. So mm -hmm. we need more of it mm -hmm. in a way. I think one of the movies used to be really communal and now it's, it's less so, mm -hmm. but I think theater will always be communal because it always has to be people in the room doing it together. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that won't change, and so I don't. I think that we should engage the current forms of communication. I, I just think that um, we listen differently, we behave differently. Um, so we should try to understand what that means and how that's affecting people. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's re I think it's very possible to theatricalize that. I always say you can't expect people to come to you if you're not willing to go to them. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I'm not coming to your house for a, I'm not gonna leave my house and come to your house for a meal. I don't even know if you can cook. Like you All have right. to prove something to me. And so, do you think the theater's doing that though? It's a theater going out to people. I don't think they are. 
No. I think they send out brochures and expect people to respond. Yeah. Or uh -huh. they, you know, at most they might get in for the, you know, bigger shows where they're really trying to reach broader markets. They might get on the radio or they right. might, you know, get on television for commercials. But that's not that's not going to the, to the non-traditional theater audience. You, you have to go to them because mm -hmm. I don't think that they're going to come on their own you know it just doesn't we don't work like that i wouldn't I, I agree with that and to piggyback but i think it's not only just how you access people it's just the stories themselves that are being told yeah, i mean right. yeah. that's why yeah. i didn't that's, yeah. think theater was interesting when i was a kid i mean like when you're like 14 and like a gay latino in california reading long day's journey you're like i don't understand these like old white people right. like in a drunk house in like connecticut like that is not <laughs> what i understand right <laughs> so like the, 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 every time Mom's i, read, morphine right, I was like i don't know <laughs> yeah. i'm really sorry <laughs> I actually have a question for you, if you guys don't mind. Um, you had so you had your show this season, both at the Public and Uptown at, in Harlem, right? Yeah. Can you sort of talk about what that experience was in terms of the audiences, and I mean, what was that like moving it? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, that's a, I'm gonna say that's a good question because that's everybody's curiosity, yeah. I think. And I say this, it was definitely two different experiences and they were both amazing um, and I say the the audiences that we had downtown were you know they were sometimes that like you had like a young diverse audience mixed in but always mixed in with like the elder older you know white audience members that are in like the mm. 60s 70s you know that kind of thing and so it was always interesting to watch those audiences interact because when there was a predominantly you know black audience or people of color even and and younger and if they would like laugh and free up then it was almost teaching the mm. elder audience how to watch the play mm. as opposed to when they were in the majority of the audience it was quiet you know mm. most of the time um, but they were but they were engaged in a way that, and they were more, it felt like they actually were more heartbroken at the end of the play. Yeah. You know, when we took it uptown, I mean, they're like, it was like church, you know? <laughs> and there was so much call and response and like literally like falling out the seat, kind of laughing going on. And I mean, just behavior was at its height, you know? <laughs> <laughs> they wanted it there and they, they were so open to it. Listen to my story about a country boy. I don't think I even really knew this until recently. The things I write are very different. The worldview is the worldview of a kid who grew up in the Midwest, isolated from most popular narratives. And so I think my narratives, they tend to go places that are that surprise people sometimes. Until you put it in front of an audience, I didn't realize how my work is strange just by nature of how I grew up. When I was a kid, we moved from the suburbs of Detroit to a farm uh, outside of Port Huron in Michigan. And then we raised chickens for ourselves. It was very strange at first because it was so much more isolated, but I started writing a lot then to entertain myself because there was just nothing to do. A lot of times the thing in one of my plays that's actually from my real life is the thing that everyone believes is far-fetched or that can't possibly have happened. The truthful thing was the thing that was alien to everyone. I have two plays that are very early in their process. One that is a bit of a political play, except that there are all these magic spells in it. So it's, it's really, it's an inquiry into what power is. I've noticed that as the American public feels more and more powerless in the face of, say, uh, their government or corporate power or any, any number of things that make the average citizen feel powerless, suddenly a lot of the narratives that we're into in books and movies are about normal people acquiring superpower <laughs> and being suddenly able to change theirs and other people's fate. And so that play started because I just wondered what that anxiety was, where people actually felt so much that they couldn't affect the immediate world around them, so they immersed themselves in fantasies of people changing the world around them.
I'm a kind of, I'm a media junkie and I'm a little bit of an information junkie as well. I will come across an article or a play or a situation or a class syllabus or something and you, I start to see similarities between that and something completely different. And then as those two things become more and more connected in my brain and or more confused, that's usually when I start writing something, like, you know, if it, it makes me ask a question or whatever. And then I, and then I just write really intuitively. I don't really worry about how terrible things are um, when it's first written. I am a terrible eavesdropper. I will be having dinner with people and hear like the terrifying conversation at the next table and I'll start making faces at my phone and be like, are you listening to this? I do observe those things. I don't write them down. They do come back all by themselves um, because people are crazy. Before uh, my residency at the LORE, I knew that I would never be able to make a living writing plays, and so I had a 9-to-5 job, even though I never stopped writing. And then I got the Pony Fellowship. The amount of support that Pony gives you and the amount of artistic support that the LORE gives you, it really it made me shift my identity and realize that just because I can't make my whole living writing plays doesn't mean that playwriting and being a writer isn't the center of my life. And suddenly, it was just a complete shift in priorities. And suddenly, even the things that you end up doing for income are all, they're all to, to give you the time or the space or the energy or the stability so that I could be a writer. So suddenly, instead of writing just being this thing that I do because it feeds my soul, it's the thing that I love, or however you want to say it, suddenly it's, it is the center and everything else is sort of feeds the writing. People will compliment me and say, oh, that play is not just a gay play, or that play is not just an Asian play. And then on the other side, people will say, oh, the play is not gay enough, or the play is not Asian enough. Both of those arguments come from, not from what I'm writing, but from their very limited idea of what a gay or Asian American play can be. Um, I think all of my plays are gay and Asian American, and I want them to be, whether people think they are Asian enough or not, or gay enough or not. Most portrayals of Asian or Asian American people on American stages involve people that have immigrated um, or live in an urban environment. The plays that I write are very American. You know, like that's, you know, a lot of the things that I write could only happen here because of the strange, you know, the many waves of immigration and the obsession in America with identity politics and identity. People have a very limited idea of what America or an American is, and it's bleeding into their artistic ideas. It's crippling their artistic ideas. I've had the thing happen in a talk back where someone will be like, why is this character Filipino? You know, and I actually did say once to someone, I was like, well, why are you white? And, um, and she, <laughs> the person was just totally flabbergasted. And I was like, they're Filipino because I'm Filipino. And, you know, and that's, you know, th th there's, uh, there's no reason that I am of this ethnicity. I was just born this ethnicity. And so it's the same with those characters. You know, I, I don't feel like there has to be a dramaturgical justification for someone's race. There is no dramaturgical justification for my race or ethnicity. It's merely a fact. You know, all of us are, you know, um, struggling in an art form that, that has its limitations in terms of finances, shall we say? And I'm just curious if what you guys do, not so much like what your day jobs are, um, but if, if film is appealing, or do you guys write screenplays, or is television something that, that you think about? Um, I love film and TV. Like, I, I consume it in a, at an uncomfortable amount. And, um, <laughs> but at the same time, like, there's something about it that, like, I, I've, I've thought about m moving into it or, you know, doing it for money or something. And it, I just, whenever I, whenever I sit down and I'm like, okay, I'm going to go to LA and have meetings or I'm going, I'm going to finally write a spec or I'm going to, like, do a screenplay, like, I end up getting a theater thing. Mm -hmm. And then, and even if the theater thing is, like, small, I'm just like, okay. <laughs> you know, and like I just go, I'm just like, I'm going to do the theater thing, like, you know, mm -hmm. and I, 
you know, so it's it's not that I um, it's not that I have no love for those other media or that I'm even you know trying actively not to, but I do know that I love theater more. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. And then you know now is like as I have been able to just write theater for the past few years. There's just been, you know, just watching the way my plays have been changing, and you know, it's mm. uh, there's some there's a whole part of that like I don't want to be taken away from it, even if like nobody ever produces a play again. It's just like I don't know. They, you know, now that I have all of this time to really write whatever I want and not have to think about getting produced, or you know, that I only have enough time in a day to write one idea. Right. Like they just, you know, they're the my plays are surprising me again, you know, mm. and so it's. I, I would find it really hard, I think, right now to move away from that. Right. This year I wrote and we shot um, two, two short films just to like feel what it's like. Because I just said it was mm. so abstract. I was like, I don't know. And I, I wrote a scene in a hallway and we had to film it in a hallway, a real <laughs> hallway. And the doors were closed and there was the lights and it was a million degrees. And then I wrote a scene on a boat. And we had to shoot it in the ocean, and there was like 20 knot winds that were like pushing us back as we were filming. And there are things that we could only do once because then, you know. Have you heard of a living room? <laughs> <laughs> Interior living room day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I think I learned that like film is like everything is tech, and then the acting happens like almost by chance in between the things. <laughs> and I think like theater is my is my love, but it was really fun to find like the joy in filmmaking because for me it was like there were screenplays and then there was trying to sell screenplays there was no like mm -hmm. as of yet like movie making yeah I mean I started writing screenplays in 1992 I think you guys were born <laughs> um, and uh, I had my first film actually made in 2004 so that was a 12 year gap mm -hmm. where I thought screenwriting was about writing things no one will ever make I actually love theater but I actually think it's almost less makeable than than film um, because with theater like if you self-produce hopefully people will come you spend a lot of money and you know who knows and I think a couple years ago Jeffrey Scott who was at New York Theater Workshop and is now at Victory Gardens said to me are you a playwright or are you a writer and I he's like if you're a writer you, you can do more than write plays and I really took that to, to heart and so I decided that I would do these things that I wouldn't normally do um, and so a friend of mine asked to write a web series mm. and I would never have done that. I thought it was such a weird idea. And not only did we end up writing it, I ended up starring in it along him. Mm -hmm. And it it actually got viewed by so many people. It just got passed around. And the thing about that is that because of the DIY movement, like we made this, now people, people have seen it and I've gotten stuff out of it um, in a way that theater has not been as, as accessible for me. Um, and. And the truth is, like, there's so much good TV happening now. For the, I mean, I, I I used to like TV. Now I love it, and I sort of feel like, why am I like working so hard to be part of this? I mean, like, I love the theater community, but in terms of the productions that are happening, I don't really love what's being produced. It takes too long. It lasts one day. I get paid eight hundred dollars. Whereas I, what? I love <laughs> 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 Who is your agent? <laughs> I'm not going to give away all the secrets, you guys. It's too soon for that. Um, but you know, it is, and, and, and then like with movies, it's like you can see it and it lasts forever, and people can. And so, um, this last year, I really actively decided that I was going to pursue TV and film with all I had. And so my agents were like, you know, there's a lot of playwrights that I love who like have had one hit play and then disappeared to TV forever, and mm -hmm. I didn't want that to happen. So they were like, if you can really focus on writing three to five plays that are like ready then you, sh you can go do that because we can still mm -hmm. send your stuff out. That'll allow me to actually do theater for a, a lot longer. I, I feel like a lot of people don't want to sit for three hours in a theater at, that where like the set doesn't change mm -hmm. because that's just not how they view stuff anymore. Like I think people's brains have shifted. You know, you're watching TV, you're watching movies, it's different. And uh, a lot of the theater still wants to stay the same as opposed to just letting the storytelling shift. I like can't go to the opera because I sit there for 30 minutes and I'm like this this girl has been singing the same three lines for you know like my mind just can't sit still so, so hates Shakespeare hates <laughs> opera <laughs> blame it on my youth I just don't know better <laughs> just say that I really really like uh, loud places actually the library has always been a scary place for me it's too quiet it feels dead and my head just uh, the, all the noise 
gets sort of really loud in my head. And when I go to loud places, it makes the noise in my head have to go quiet. The things that I'm most interested in my writing have to do with identity. Uh, I, I'm curious about how race and class have changed, how um, gender and sexuality is uh, evolving. And so the characters that I write about are people who find themselves as contradictions of what people think they are or should be. They're people who really haven't found their identity and they're constantly searching for it, trying to figure out what to keep and what to discard in the way that people view them. I don't do a lot of note taking. I actually spend a lot of time doing other things besides writing, you know, going to the movies, hanging out with friends, just doing stuff every day is very, very inspiring and it just fills my head up with, with information. And at some point when I finally sit down to write, all the really important stuff is what is stuck in my head and that, that's what gets out. I find that other art really sort of opens up my mind and makes me think about my own work in a different way. I also like to play music a lot. Sometimes I'll listen to the same record or artist over and over and over for as long as I'm working on a specific play to let that mood or ambiance affect the work. Everybody hears the world in a very specific, unique way. So when a writer sits down, it's still filtered through the way that they hear things. Every play that I write, every scene, I don't always know where I'm going and for me it's really important to sort of just let the characters speak which I used to hear people say that and thought it was a mystical weird thing but really when I sit down and write I'll write down a line and then the other character will have some response that I didn't know was going to happen um, so for me a lot of that is just about letting the words appear as I need them for me writing is sort of like a bucket of water in my head. It has to fill itself up with information and data and ideas and questions and at some point when it's full it'll all spill over and that's when I sort of find the need to write the play because I have all this that needs to get out. You know, and other writers write every single day. I can't do that. I can't really sit and write until I have something that needs to get out. and every time I write a new play, it feels like the first time I've ever written a play before. And when it's over, you know, I, I'm watching a play of mine right now that's in production, and every time that I see it, I, it feels like somebody else wrote it. When I first started in the theater, I was an actor, and I really loved it, but then uh, I think I got really uncomfortable being on stage. Um, I felt really exposed. I also don't think that I was the best actor, honestly but a teacher of mine said, you're a storyteller. And so I started writing and then I never stopped. I really loved it because it was a way to expose and question all the things that I have trouble with and wonder about and still be really honest and open but without having to be actually in front of people. I wrote two plays in the last couple of years. The play that is being done at the Flea right now, A Cautionary Tale, and another play of mine, the one that's gonna be turned into a movie, uh, which is called, I wonder if it's possible to have a love affair that lasts forever, or Things I Found on Craigslist. It's a really long title. They're both plays about similar things at different times. So Craigslist is about people who are my age, 26 to 32. We were the time that was both before and after the internet, um, the cusp. And then I think of A Cautionary Tale, which is about kids in high school now, and how they've never known a time where they haven't had cell phones or the internet. I think there is something really inherently political about storytelling, because you're sharing a, a point of view or a question. And for me, I didn't realize just how much of that I was doing until very recently. I'm a Latino playwright, and I write a lot of plays with a lot of Asian characters. And that's been something that people talk about a lot. You know, why is Latino kid writing these stories? Why isn't he writing plays about being Latino? Why isn't he writing stories about being gay? Other people who interpret my work want something. Um, and I don't always know what that is. 
I think people have been evolving and identity is so fluid now and you know there's a lot of mixed children and I just feel like people aren't caught up to the, to the reality that everything isn't black or white. And I think we talk about that, but then when you see people's work, there's expectations about what the work should look like. And I don't believe in that. And I, I can't actually write the things that people think I should write because it feels disingenuous and like a lie. And I don't know those stories. In a way, you are the character in the world of the internet. And you present yourself and you make choices. There is a story that is being told. You can go back and look at people's Instagrams and Twitters and you can trace a story. It's sort of the mythology of who you are as a person. There's something that's both exciting, the way that we can record a life, and also terrifying in the way that realizing 10 years later that you've left a whole history that you now have to reconcile with. My parents and I are very, very close, but I, I don't know a lot about their pasts. They're lovely, but they're very private, and I think they retain a lot of information, and I think that's gonna be different for us. I think our information is all there, and so how will our kids read the narrative of who we were? I try really hard to think about like theatricality and like the magic of theater making and like shadows and just I don't know like where you, things are happening like actually I mean the joy of vaudeville or just different forms mm -hmm. that are very much theatrical I think that I'm afraid of when a play feels like a sitcom and it happens mm -hmm. it happens a lot I do think there's one bad habit that a lot of playwrights have right now that we get from TV whereas like we get in the scene and then the information bomb drops and then the scene ends mm -hmm. <laughs> because the television needs to go to commercial or it needs to yeah. sustain a really simple story for four acts over an hour. Mm -hmm. And so like I do sometimes go to plays where I'm like, no, that's actually where your play starts. Like where you just ended that scene is where the drama actually begins, like right mm -hmm. after that information bomb. Or stuff where it's like, you know, it's really theatrical mm -hmm. stuff. Like people are about to have sex and then the scene ends. And it's like, no, in theater you can show people having sex and it makes people really uncomfortable and it's very, yeah. it's very exciting. You can... <laughs> it's like, that's theater. <laughs> but we get used to TV where it's like, okay, sex, done. Next, you know, and so it's, I think that there's some bad habits that we get. Mm. Susan has, you had this wonderful play last year that your club thumb show mm -hmm. what's it called i can't take the title yeah and, yeah and there's like um it's actually really theatrical with the with the form but i remember that moment where those two characters were on the train <laughs> like it was like a like a like my brain was like warped and like twilight zone and it was like a for me it was like a real moment of awe because it, like something had exploded mm -hmm. and in a way that i think um like that wouldn't have worked on film you know yeah. because either we see too much of it or and that's what the movie does all the time, mm -hmm. or there's not enough of it. And you did this thing where like suddenly the room had like shifted for me. And I remember mm -hmm. just being like um, so surprised by it and um, and feeling like yeah, this can this cannot work anywhere else, you know. Mm -hmm. well, and, yeah, it was like there's you actually it was probably the best theatrical metaphor for to get a, an American audience to culturally understand Japanese people. I mean, I don't know if that, if that makes sense, but that's how I, afterwards I felt like, because you know, I, you know, you meet Japanese people, you're like, why, you know, why are they so passive aggressive? Or like, why, do you know what I mean? You're like, why is that just the way that they conduct their culture? I don't understand. And there was just something about this scene that was like, whoa, I understand. you <laughs> want <laughs> When I was a little kid, I traveled around Asia with my mother and I got lost in a market. And it was very smoky, there were stalls of pig's heads and all kinds of things. All of a sudden this very tall man that I'd never seen before in my life grabs me by the arm, lifts me up and he sort of like shakes me and he says, you know what happens to little girls who run away from their mothers, their hands and their feet are cut off and their eyes are gouged out and they're sent off to Malaysia or somewhere and they never come home again. It was really terrifying and I think for many years I thought that was gonna happen to me. <laughs> and so I think a lot of my plays focus on uh, kind of like a nameless dread or something a little bit scary or, or visceral in the way that I think I felt in that moment. I 
I'm really interested in theater, the immediate connection with the audience of that we are sh sharing the same air. If the theater is hot, the actors and the audience are hot or cold or, you know, there's, there's something about that connection that I feel like sometimes we can forget. And the idea of that it, there's something visceral and, and even a little bit scary or dangerous about there's real life people in front of you. I don't want theater to feel like film or, or TV. I want it to really embrace the medium it is, the, the challenges of it, and the immediacy of it. I draw a lot from mythology and old folk stories and ghost stories, especially Pacific Rim, Asian ghost stories, like Japanese ghost stories. I draw from art images. I've been an artist assistant on and off for about 10 years. When I write, I start off in a very visual place. I make masks as well. I think. This, is a, <laughs> this is a cast of my head. So all the masks kind of fit my face the best, and then I, I, build, I build on top of it with the clay. And then I just do paper mache or... Um, this, is, this is buckram. This is, a, this is a hat making material. So it, um, you, can, you can cover the eyes and you can, you can see through it. <laughs> it's a little bit scary, but yeah. I like using my hands. I like tactile. So for me, looking at art or making art or helping out a friend by making masks or props for a show or sewing a quilt, is a really good distraction and it helps me think differently. It breaks up the time from just typing and, and reading and writing. I tend to do a lot of research for my plays and most of it doesn't go in, but I just kind of surround myself with it. I spend months just reading everything obsessively about the subject and looking at images, I'll put up images, I'll have, if somebody has a really exciting quote that I feel is relevant, or I'll make a timeline. I'll do a lot of work on the front end, and then I put it all away, and I don't look at it unless I really have to. I just don't want to be afraid of what I'm really getting at, because I think that the human conflict and the characters are more important, but you don't, you don't want to be wrong, but you, I don't let the information front load like the story I want to tell. If all I wanted to is tell somebody information then I shouldn't be writing the play, I should be writing something else. I like being a playwright over other kinds of writing with being a novelist because you get to see how your words affect people. So I'm not, I'm very shy, I'm not naturally very funny, but I could tell a joke and some very clever actors could go on stage and perform that joke and I could make 200 people laugh. And there's something very satisfying about being able to do that. becoming my home. I'm from Hawaii. My home is very important to me because I do feel very far away. I do miss home a lot. Even though I love the city and the energy of it, I think it's kind of overwhelming for me. So I try to find certain things that remind me of where I'm from. I've noticed that displacement is a big theme of sort of what is home or places that should be familiar being strange. I'm very interested in the difficulty people have with communicating. I have several plays where it's a series of either phone calls that don't go through or even kind of epistolary letters that don't come through. Production is always greater than a single vision that I have, that I really love collaborating. I, I don't think I would be any other kind of writer. Whenever I work with a great director, they'll have just a simple statement and it'll make me see the entire play different, make me realize the reason why I thought I was writing the play wasn't, you know, why I set out, that they'll change everything. I was the inaugural Van Leer Fellow, so I was in the Lark all the time for over a year with the fellowship, and it continues. It's a very safe space for me, and I know a lot of people just to develop work, and they don't produce, and I like that because there isn't that expectation of trying to impress them. It's really just, what do you need, and, and how can we help you get you know, your play to where it needs to be. I don't know if I would be in New York in some ways if it wasn't for the Lark. Because there's so much and it's so saturated, I think it's hard to feel like the, the work, the art, it matters. When you do a play, it's like, how do you get someone to see it? Whereas, you know, in Hawaii, if you're doing a show, maybe there's three shows in town and everyone will go to see them.
sometimes setbacks are good. I think sometimes when you have too much money or people trust you too much, it's actually bad. There's something important about being afraid to fail, being afraid that it won't, it won't come out right. I think that when everyone tells you you're great and you've been great for a long time, maybe you're not fueled in the same way of just, I have to tell the story, I have to get it out there or I'll never work again. So, Ray, I was curious yeah. that the beautiful play you brought in last year at the Lark workshop about the bookstore, oh, was the bookstore. that observed yeah. or was that lived? Well, no, that was, I mean, I work, I actually, I work, a bookstore was my college job. The, the thing that started that play was reading all of this stuff about bullying mm -hmm. and, you know, and things like that. And then meeting all of these um, younger gay people who are nothing like me, who, um, because uh, coming out of the closet is, is easier now, which I know people, I'm not, that's probably not a good thing to say because there are a lot of people struggling, mm -hmm. but because it is easier now, you don't go through this entire like soul searching, reevaluating of your entire life and all of your politics and your ideas of gender before you can be like, okay, I'm gay, I'm comfortable with it. And so I started meeting all of these young gay men who come out and they're so misogynist or homophobic mm -hmm. and they don't even know and, mm -hmm. you know, or like they're so politically, um, you know, they hate transgendered people. They, you know, just things that like shock me <laughs> where I'm like, the, those people made your life possible. Like, can, you know, right. could you just take them, you know, or the, or they're like anti-sex in weird ways or prudish about sex. So, the, so the, you know, so that stuff is all from observation. Do, do you feel a particular responsibility to discuss um, gender and, and sexuality in your work? Or do you think that's just so much a part of you, you can't help it? I think it's the second, yeah. Mm -hmm. It just always, yeah. So you don't it's think, I've got, I've got something I need to say in terms of this that might help other people? I, I think about it in terms of just diversifying the landscape that mm -hmm. way. Like, do, you, do you guys generally feel a political responsibility in terms of your art? Or do you feel, I just, I just want to be an artist that makes art that I love for the love of it? I never begin with the message. They mm. feel like I don't want to tell somebody how to feel, sort of. Mm. It just feels very, I'm, I'm very opposed to like didactic mm -hmm. theater. I think when, when a message is that easy to give, mm -hmm. I think that the message is probably not that complicated, and therefore it's not really worth sitting through for me. Mm -hmm. um, but what I do think is that I'm constantly um, confused about things that I don't understand or don't know, how, don't know how to feel about. And so I think that I try to write plays that um, uh, make characters sort of face those questions. Mm -hmm. um, and so at the very least to get to end a play in a place where there is one or two questions for an audience to have to mm -hmm. sort of reevaluate it for themselves. Mm -hmm. I don't think, um, again, I don't feel like I have the answer to a lot mm -hmm. of things. I certainly don't want to give um, a wrong answer to anybody. Um, <laughs> yikes. <laughs> <laughs> That's a heck of a responsibility. Your um, kids are going to have a great time. <laughs> <laughs> I, like, I got nothing for yeah, you. Right. <laughs> Ask your dad. <laughs> All I got is questions. <laughs> and then there's the, the idea of responsibility is a heavy one for me mm -hmm. because I do feel similarly, you know, that I want to create roles for people. I'm also an actress of color so I do know what we're up against mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I but I don't think you know oh I gotta make this play have a black woman at the helm you know my stories are naturally gonna have that because that's what I know the best right. so I'm gonna the, my characters there's always gonna be one somewhere you know <laughs> I can't hide from the black woman <laughs> <laughs> She's coming at me. She's, <laughs> She's in my reflection. Like, yeah. you, you can't resist. You can't resist her. Um, but I also just, I want to tell the stories of like the things that I've experience or seen or witness I want to you know bring my family and my aunts and my mm. and the people that I mm. have seen in my life to, right. I want to put them on stage because they're mm. hilarious and <laughs> someone should laugh with them at them with me you mm -hmm, know mm -hmm. um, and that's you know that's what I know to do but the I think the politics always affect the people so if you say you know are you a political writer I'm like I don't really I'm not pushing a political agenda but politics always impact the people so mm -hmm. if you're writing about the people something's gonna some they're gonna be in some condition and that has something to do with a, a greater scheme of things that you know
I don't have the answers to. Yeah. Yeah. So you guys have, well, you had to go on, I was thinking of acting in your own work. You you went on in Massacre. Right, for a couple of performances, yeah. yeah. How was that? Yeah. Yeah. So I went on for an actor who had left the show to do a film, and mm. yeah, I mean, it was like the most terrifying experience, because <laughs> I had like, I had to literally fall on stage, I had to get slapped, I had to put a guy in a meat hook, I, you know, so there's oh, all right. this right. stuff. Had you ever done that before, your own work? Ever? Never, wow. never, ever. I think if I memorized an actor went off on lines in front of me, I, yeah, I would, I'd freak out on stage. <laughs> or you're like, I couldn't possibly be fully, I've never done it, I couldn't you, be in it. You're in two places at once. Yeah. 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 And, well, thank you guys yeah. for thank hanging much. out and eating and talking, <laughs> and um, hope you like the strawberries. <laughs> 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 <laughs>